Hello, my name is Jean, and I am a physician assistant with the orthopedic department at Michigan Medicine. If you are watching this video, you are already scheduled for a hip replacement or considering a hip replacement. This 25-minute video, along with the total hip booklet, will help prepare you for your upcoming surgery. A hip replacement is a very common procedure in the United States. Well over 750,000 hip replacements are done each year. Currently at Michigan Medicine, 95% of hip replacements are doing well at 20 years, with infection or dislocation being the primary reason they are redone. The one-year infection rate is 0.6% if your body mass index is less than 35. What are the goals of your hip replacement? The number one goal is pain relief. We will take out the arthritic painful hip and replace it with a new artificial hip. Number two, we will improve your hip motion. I'm sure many of you have not been able to put your shoes or socks on for quite a while because you cannot reach your feet. You will be able to do this on your own after surgery once your hip precautions are released. Number three, improve the quality of your life. We want to get you back out there to do the things you want to do. Here is a picture of a normal hip, an arthritic hip, and a replaced hip. The normal hip on the far left shows a smooth surface covering the joint. Every joint in your body, your hip joints, your knee joints, your foot and ankle joints, your shoulder joints, even the tiny joints in your fingers are covered with a smooth, white, glistening surface called cartilage. This cartilage allows your joints to move like ice on ice. Arthritis, and it doesn't matter what type of arthritis you have, destroys the cartilage all the way down to bone as shown in the middle picture. Now you have bone rubbing on bone and that is very painful and your joint does not move easily. It's like sandpaper rubbing on sandpaper. A hip replacement shown on the right removes all the arthritic parts and replaces them with artificial parts. In surgery we will remove your arthritic ball, clean out any remaining cartilage in the acetabular cup, we will put in a new titanium metal cup with a plastic cross-linked polyethylene liner. A titanium stem goes down your thigh bone, your femur, and a new ball is placed on that, most often a ceramic ball. This is your new hip. If your bone is very thin or osteoporotic, we might cement the stem in place, but in general, most stems and cups are press fit, no cement and your bone will grow into the porous surface of the prosthesis over the next several months to hold it firmly in place. What are the risks of having your hip replacement? With any surgical procedure, whether it's a joint replacement, your appendix or gallbladder removed, or even open heart surgery, there are always complications or problems that can occur. Possible complications include continued pain, heart attack, stroke, pneumonia, blood clots, even death. We want you to be well prepared for surgery to reduce your risk of complications. Before surgery, everyone will have a pre-op physical, blood work, and a nasal swab. The nasal swab is to look for that bug everyone has heard of called MRSA. Everyone has bacteria that normally live on your skin. 30% of the people walking around in the community are natural carriers of MRSA. That does not mean you have an infection. It just means it's one of the bugs that likes to live on your skin. We just want to know before surgery if you have that bug on your skin, if you're a natural carrier. If so, if the test is positive, we will contact you and have you take a special shower for the five days leading up to surgery and use an antibiotic ointment in your nose twice a day for the five days leading up to surgery. Then, depending on your own personal health history, you may also require additional testing or to be seen by a specialist, for example, a heart, kidney, or lung specialist to make sure you are optimized for surgery. Additional things we do before surgery to reduce your risk of complication after surgery. If you are a diabetic, we will check a blood test called a hemoglobin A1C. 
This blood test tells us how well your sugars have been managed over the past three months. If your sugars have not been well managed, you are at increased risk for post-op complications. We want your hemoglobin A1C to be 7.5 or less. If it is higher, our nurse will contact you and have you work with whomever manages your diabetes currently to get it under better control. We will postpone your surgery and reschedule it once your A1C is 7.5 or less. Another thing we check is your BMI, your body mass index. This is a calculation of your height and weight. We want your BMI to be 35 or less or at the very most 40. Lots of studies show that once your weight starts creeping up, your risk of post-op complications starts going up. Once your BMI gets to 40, your complication goes up dramatically, more than double the complication rate. For your safety, your surgery may not be scheduled until you get your weight down. We have nutritionists on staff that can work with you to help you achieve your goal weight. We will also screen you for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is when you fall asleep at night and your breathing slows down and stops for seconds to minutes. Many of you have sleep apnea and have a machine that we will have you bring to the hospital. We are more concerned with patients who do not know they have sleep apnea. Why is that? We will be giving you narcotic pain pills after surgery. Narcotic pain pills can also slow your respirations. If we give you narcotic pain pills and you have undiagnosed sleep apnea, the combination can stop your breathing and deaths have been reported in patients who did not know they had sleep apnea and took narcotic pain pills. If the sleep apnea screening questions are positive, we will arrange for you to have a sleep study before surgery to see if you truly have the diagnosis of sleep apnea. If you are a smoker, you must stop smoking before we will schedule you for surgery. Nicotine makes your blood vessels constrict and smokers have more wound complications, difficulty healing their incision, leading to increased infection rates. We will get a urine test to check for nicotine before scheduling your surgery. You must be nicotine free for two weeks in order for this test to be negative. That means no cigarettes, e-cigarettes, nicotine gum, or nicotine patches. Nothing with nicotine in it. Do not start smoking again after we schedule your surgery. We will test you again at some point before surgery. Let's talk about some problems and risks that are specific to a joint replacement. After a joint replacement, it is possible to develop a blood clot in your legs called a DVT, deep venous thrombosis. A clot in your legs can cause a painful swollen leg, which can last for months. This clot could break loose and travel up to your lungs, causing a blood clot in your lungs called a pulmonary embolus. A blood clot in your lungs can be life-threatening. This can kill you. Because of a number of things we do, we can reduce your risk of getting a blood clot to only 1-2%. to 2 to reduce the risk of blood clots. Number one, we will get you up and get you moving right away. Most patients are walking the day of surgery. This has been proven to be the number one most effective tool in preventing blood clots. Number two, you will be placed on a blood thinning medication every day for four weeks after surgery. If you have no risk factors for a blood clot, it will likely be something as simple as an over-the-counter low dose 81 milligram aspirin once a day for four weeks. If you have any risk factors for a blood clot, for example, a past history of a blood clot, a cancer diagnosis in the past five years, or are on some medications that increase your risk of a clot, then we will put you on a prescription blood thinner, something like Coumadin, Xeralto, or Eliquis. If you are placed on a prescription blood thinner, our pharmacist will talk to you about it while you are in the hospital. Number three, we will have you wear those white knee-high support stockings every day for the first two weeks after surgery. 
We will provide them and put them on you in the hospital. We want you to wear them during the day, have your support coach help take them off at night, and put them back on in the morning. At your two-week post-op visit, whoever you see in the clinic will let you know if you need to continue wearing them. Number four, do the few simple exercises in the book that help to increase the blood flow back to your heart. The ankle pumps are especially important to help prevent blood clots. What are the signs of a blood clot and what do you do about them? A blood clot will cause pain in your calf or your thigh, especially when you are up walking or doing your ankle pumps. Also, if you have increased swelling in your legs, that won't go away with elevation. If you have either of these, call our nursing clinic and she will arrange for you to have an ultrasound of your leg to look for a blood clot. If you live far away, she will make arrangements for you to have the test done locally. But if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, confusion, your heart is racing, or something just doesn't feel right, do not call us. If you have any of those symptoms, call 911 and get to your nearest emergency room to get checked for a blood clot in your lungs. Do not wait hoping this will go away. Do not have your family, your neighbor, or a friend drive you to the emergency room. Call the ambulance. They come quickly and they have oxygen on board and will get you to the emergency room quickly and you get to go to the front of the line when you get there. You can call us later and tell us what happened, but your first call should be to 911. How does a joint infection happen and how do you keep this from happening? Infections are caused by bacteria, not viruses. If you get a cold or the flu, you don't have to worry, it will not affect your joint. Bacteria from infections like a tooth infection, bladder infection, or skin infection can get into your bloodstream. Your normal body defenses would wipe them out but now that you have a new joint in place, the bacteria see that as a great place to set up housekeeping. They attach themselves to the surface of the prosthesis and you cannot get rid of them. The only way to get rid of them is to take the prosthesis out. Before having surgery, you must be free of any infections. No tooth infections, skin infections, bladder infections. You should also not have any skin abrasions or cuts especially over the site of the incision. If you have questions about this, please call our nurse. After surgery, you need to make sure you get any infections treated appropriately. To reduce the risk of infection at the time of surgery, we ask that you take a special shower the night before and again the morning of surgery. These instructions are on page 45 of the HIP book. When you come in for your surgery, you will be given antibiotics through your IV just before the start of surgery. At the end of surgery, we will close your incision and seal it with surgical glue. We are now using a waterproof dressing that we will ask you to leave on for 10 days after surgery. You can wash right over this dressing, just don't soak in a tub. After 10 days, you will be instructed to remove the dressing then you can shower over the incision. Do not use ointments and don't soak in a tub until there are absolutely no scabs on your incision.
When you go home, you will notice that your thigh is warm and the area surrounding the dressing might be pink. This is perfectly normal. It may be warm for several months. Again, perfectly normal. Call our nurse if you notice that the skin is redder or hotter or you have a fever. And a fever for us is 101.5. If you have any wound drainage, please call our nurse. Your teeth can be a source of infection. Bacteria normally live along everyone's gum line. When you get your teeth cleaned by the dental hygienist, they often get your gums bleeding and the bacteria along your gum line can get into the bloodstream. Before surgery, we ask that you do not get your teeth cleaned for the two weeks just before. It is okay to have them cleaned two, three, or four weeks before surgery. That would allow enough time to have any bacteria cleared out of your bloodstream before we make the skin incision. Of course, if you have a tooth that is bothering you, you need to get this checked out before surgery to make sure you do not have an infection. After surgery, we ask you to wait three months to allow your hip to settle in and heal before you have your teeth cleaned. When you do make the appointment to get your teeth cleaned, call our clinic and we will call an antibiotic into your pharmacy. Take that antibiotic one hour before your dental appointment. Take the empty bottle with you to your dentist and show them what we prescribed. This is what we want you to take each and every time you get your teeth cleaned or have work done that manipulates your gums. We recommend that you do this for at least two years after your joint replacement. Your dentist can then prescribe the antibiotic. For more information about taking antibiotics when you go to your dentist, you can go to the American Dental Association website. This letter is available in the front pocket of your hip book. It is meant for you to take and share with your dentist so that you can both discuss the need for antibiotic prophylaxis after your joint replacement. Pain management after your hip replacement. Michigan Medicine has had a pain protocol in place since 2015 that has worked very well. It is a combination of medications that are given to you in the pre-op area, during surgery, and then after surgery. A spinal anesthetic is also part of the pain protocol. All of these help to manage your pain very well in the immediate post-op period. Most patients are up walking the day of surgery and are discharged home either the day of surgery or the day after surgery. Newer, safer drugs, along with advances in monitoring equipment, make today's anesthesia safer than ever before. The risks of anesthesia are related to your general health and medical condition. Your anesthesiologist will review your medical history and meet with you on the day of surgery to discuss your anesthetic options. As I mentioned, our pain protocol uses a spinal anesthetic for surgery. With a spinal anesthetic, you are asleep from the waist down, but you are still breathing on your own. You do not need to have a tube down your throat to help you breathe. You can have sedation during surgery so that you nap throughout the operation. Studies show that patients who had a spinal anesthetic for their joint replacements had fewer post-op complications at one year follow-up than patients who had a general anesthetic. Having said this, not all patients are able to have a spinal anesthetic. Talk to your anesthesiologist on the day of surgery about your anesthetic options. Managing your pain after surgery involves several modalities. Number one, you should ice your hip and thigh often over the next several weeks to months. It's easy to remember to apply ice for 20 minutes every hour. For example, at noon, 20 minutes, one o'clock, 20 minutes, two o'clock, 20 minutes, and so on. You do not have to get up in the middle of the night to ice your hip though, but you should ice frequently. Icing will help reduce swelling and bleeding into your joint. Number two, elevate your legs whenever sitting and don't stand in one spot for too long. That puts a lot of pressure on your thigh and increases swelling. So when you are up, walk around. When you sit, put your legs up in a recliner or on an ottoman. Number three, take Tylenol on a regular basis. Take it around the clock for several weeks. This will help reduce how much narcotic pain pills you need to take. You will be happy to hear that many hip replacements do well on just Tylenol. 
And lastly, you will be given a prescription for a narcotic pain pill. Take this as needed. It will generally be written for you to take one or two tablets every four to six hours as needed. That means if you're comfortable, you do not need to take it. Narcotic pain medications are helpful in managing your pain, but they are not the only thing you should use. They can be addicting and they are very constipating. Always use ice, elevation, and taking Tylenol around the clock will help minimize your need for narcotics. This is a copy of the opioid start talking form required by the state of Michigan. You will be asked to sign this form when you are in the hospital, acknowledging that you have been told about all the risks of taking a narcotic. There are risks of addiction and substance abuse. You should not take a narcotic with other sedating medications such as sleeping pills, Valium, Xanax, or similar medications. Do not take it with muscle relaxants or alcohol. If you have narcotic medication left over, you should dispose of it properly. You can ask your sheriff's department or local pharmacy about how to dispose of it safely. Do not flush it down the toilet. And lastly, you should know that it is a felony to share this medication, give this medication, or sell this medication to someone else. If you need a refill for your narcotic medication, you need to call our nurse navigator during regular business hours. Our residents have been instructed not to refill narcotic pain medications after hours. So you need to keep track of your medications, and if running low on Friday, you need to call Friday for a refill. We will not refill narcotics after hours or on the weekend. Okay, let's get ready. We would like you to start doing these exercises before surgery. They will not hurt your hip, but will help with your recovery after surgery. They are in the hip book on pages 40 to 42 and also the physical therapy PowerPoint online. Seven days before surgery, you need to stop taking any vitamins, supplements, or medication, which is listed on the following slide or page 16 of the HIP book. These medications primarily consist of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, for example, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Aspirin, and others. These medications thin your blood. We do not want to thin your blood before surgery. If you are taking aspirin because you have a stent in your heart and your heart doctor puts you on aspirin, then you will be told at your pre-op physical whether or not to stop this. Often we have you continue this medication. This is the one exception to the rule. But if you were taking aspirin because you thought taking aspirin was a good idea and you started it on your own, then go ahead and stop it. If you are taking a prescription blood thinner, some examples include Coumadin, Plavix, Xeralto, and Eliquis, you will get specific instructions about how and when to stop these medications at your pre-op physical. You will need to stop them, but you will get specific instructions about stopping them. Do continue to take your other medications. Do not stop your blood pressure medicine, your diabetic medicine, your cholesterol or thyroid medications. Take your regular medications unless specifically told to stop. Here is the list of medications that you need to stop a week before surgery. And again, it is on page 16 of the HIP book. Many of these medications you may have been taking for pain management. Now what do you do? Do not start taking a narcotic pain pill and do not go up on any narcotic pain pills you might currently be taking. We need you to reduce how much narcotic pain pills you take. If you're taking a lot of narcotics or have been taking narcotics for years, it will be very difficult to manage your pain after surgery. We recommend that you take instead acetaminophen, commonly known as Tylenol, on a regularly scheduled basis. Studies show that if you keep your blood level of acetaminophen up by taking it on a regular basis, it works so much better than if you just take it now and then. 
On page 17 of the hip book, it shows you different ways that you can take Tylenol. What to purchase before surgery. You should purchase some laxatives and stool softeners to use after surgery while you are taking narcotic pain pills. Narcotics are very constipating. You should take a laxative and or stool softener post-op for as long as you are taking the prescription pain pills. You should also purchase some Tylenol. We recommend over-the-counter extra strength 500 milligrams. We will want you to take this on a regular basis after surgery to help with your pain management and to help reduce how much narcotic pain pills you need to take. You should purchase an over-the-toilet commode. Toilets, unless you have a comfort height, are very low and do not come with arms. After your hip replacement, you will be on hip precautions for 6 to 12 weeks. One of your precautions may limit bending forward at the waist. This will make it difficult for you to get up and down from the toilet. With the raised commode, the toilet seat will be higher and will have arms that will assist you getting on and off the toilet. Most insurance companies do not cover these, but you can find them fairly inexpensively at Myers, Walmart, churches, senior citizen centers, the American Legion, and even the Salvation Army. Put this in place before you come to the hospital because you know that's the first place you're going when you get home. Do not go out and buy a walker before surgery. If you already have a walker, one with two front wheels, no seat, bring that with you to the hospital. But if you do not have a walker, we will get one for you while you are in the hospital that will be yours to take home. This is your checklist for success. It is found on page five of the hip book. If you do everything on this checklist, you will be good to go for surgery. Your surgery will be scheduled at one of our surgery centers, either Michigan Medicine Main Campus, the Brighton Surgery Center, or Michigan Medicine Chelsea. A Michigan Medicine nurse will call you one to two business days before surgery at the preferred number in your medical record. The nurse will tell you what time to arrive and go over any last minute instructions. When you arrive, leave your suitcase in your car and your support coach can bring it to you when you've been assigned to a room after surgery. If you have a walker, you can also leave that in the car and your coach can bring that in later. If you use a CPAP, do bring this with you to the surgery check-in. In the pre-op area, you will meet with your anesthesiologist and discuss anesthetic options. Your anesthesiologist will answer any questions you may have. You will be given medications that are part of our pain protocol. One person may be able to stay with you in the pre-op area until you go to the operating room. Check with your pre-op nurse. After surgery, you will spend time in the recovery room until your anesthetic wears off. Then you will be taken to your room. Depending on how early or late you arrive in your room, a physical therapist may get you up walking the same day of surgery. If your surgery is later in the day, a nurse will get you up that evening. Some patients go home the same day as their surgery. You must be able to walk a household distance, go up and down some stairs, and get in and out of a car safely. When you go home, your support coach should be there for at least the first few days to make sure you are safe getting around. Your support coach can help get you dressed, help you put your support stockings on and off, get meals and ice as needed, but they do not need to hover over you. After a few days, your support coach should be able to leave to go to work or run errands and be confident that you can get around at home without needing 24-7 help. Your surgeon wants you to go home. Studies show that people who go home have fewer complications, fewer readmissions to the hospital, they do better and recover faster at home. If you live alone, ask friends or family if they can stay with you for a few nights until you feel safe to be home alone. If you feel you may need to go to a rehab center after your joint replacement, please call and discuss this with our nurse navigator before your surgery date. Here is a convenient checklist for you to use at home after discharge. 
It tells you everything to do at home from day one at home through day 14 at home. This is located in the front pocket of your hip book. If you do not receive this before you get to the hospital, please ask your nurse once you get to your room for a copy of the Care Pathway After Discharge. Your new joint should last you for years and years. 95% of the hips we are putting in today last 20 years plus, but you need to be kind to your joint to make it last. Number one, keep your weight down. For every 10 pounds you lose, it takes 50 pounds of stress off your joints. 50 pounds off your back, your hips, your knees, even your feet and ankles. Number two, continue the few simple exercises in the book, Lifelong, to strengthen your thighs. This will help you to remain independent. Number three, if you are a diabetic or become a diabetic in the future, keep your hemoglobin A1c 7.5 or less to decrease your risk of infections or other complications. Number four, don't smoke or use nicotine products. Nicotine prevents the bony ingrowth into the new prosthesis. And lastly, number five, enjoy your new hip. Get out and walk, bike, swim, golf, be active. We want to see you in follow-up about two weeks after surgery and then again at six weeks. Then we'll see you in a year and then every five years. But if at any time during your recovery or in years to come you're having a problem, give us a call and we'll have you come in so we can see what's going on. Here are important phone numbers for you. A nurse navigator is the most important number. She is in charge of you from the minute you are signed up for surgery until 90 days after surgery. If you have any questions or problems before or after surgery, please call our nurse navigator. The next number is our general orthopedic call center number. If the nurse navigator is not at her desk or is on the phone, your call will automatically be transferred to the call center. They can take a message and get to the nurse navigator with it. The third number is our after hours number. This is the number you would call if you're having problems after hours on weekends or holidays. Ask the paging operator to page the orthopedic resident on call. There is always an orthopedic resident available even at two in the morning. If you have any problems, you can always reach someone. These numbers and more are listed on the back cover of your hip book. Research is always a big part of Michigan medicine. In order to continue to improve care for our hip patients, you will be asked to complete a few surveys over the year following your hip replacement. This is to see how you are improving and identify areas which we can improve upon. Please take the time to complete these brief surveys when asked. You may also be eligible for an optional research study. If eligible, you will be contacted by our researchers. I hope you will sign up and help us to improve our care of all of our patients. Thank you for choosing Michigan Medicine for your joint replacement. Our cutting-edge institution offers high-quality care, world-class facilities, partnerships with research, and the opportunity to work with the best and brightest educators. We offer data-driven care focused on safety and early and full recovery.